Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us and welcome to this community lecture. My name is Mary Pruden, and I am the director of the National Kiritakonis Foundation. That is an international organization that is uh, hosted here at the Gavin Herbert I Institute, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. I'm happy to share information with all of you about this interesting disease. And my partner tonight is Dr. Matthew Wade. Dr. Wade is an associate professor of ophthalmology here at Gavin Herbert. He's a graduate of the George Washington University School of Medicine in Washington, DC. He did his internship in Utah and then came to UCI as a resident in ophthalmology. He stayed on and did a Fellowship in Cornea and External Disease under Dr. Roger Steiner, who was our uh, past chair. And then at the end of his um, training, he was asked to join the faculty. So that's wonderful. He stayed on and he has been here ever since. Dr. Wade has received numerous awards for his teaching and his mentoring. He teaches other doctors some of the latest techniques in cornea surgery. He has been an uh, Orange County Physician of Excellence for the past seven years, and I checked his Yelp scores, and they're very good. He is beloved by his patients. Good evening, Dr. Wade. Good evening. Wow, thanks. For <laughs> I'm so happy you're here. Let's get started, everybody. Hold I on. Wanna... Before we do that, I just want to tell everybody about Mary. So Mary <laughs> is, uh, you know, the National Care to Foundation offices in our building, and she has been a blast to work with. She is high energy and very passionate about working with patients who have this disease. So she's a great resource if you have any questions. And uh, as you'll see during this talk. Oh, thanks very much. All right, everyone, let's get started. I want to remind you, if you have any questions that pertain to keratoconus, put them in the chat box and we will try to um, uh, answer them at the end of this talk. So let's see if I can get this going. Okay, this is the most important thing that I hear working here is people call and say, well, I've just been diagnosed with this disease, but I can't pronounce it. So here it is, it's carrot, oh, cone us. Very easy if you break it down. There you go, you've learned something important tonight. Okay, what is keratoconus? So the two Greek words, kerato, which means cornea, that's the front clear part of the eye. That's like the window that they say of the, the window of the eye. And conus stands for cone. So we'll learn why that's important. Keratoconus uh, causes your normally round cornea to start uh, create, uh, becoming distorted with some kind of a bulge. Most cases, it is caught when you are in high school or college or as a young adult all of a sudden, your vision starts to change. Um, you suddenly think you need glasses. You can't see the board, can't see the computer, that sort of thing. Um, in rare cases, you could be eight or nine years old when those changes start. Um, and they usually continue up through middle age. So that's what makes this disease a little unique. It's bilateral. That means it affects both eyes. But for a lot of people, they have what they call one good eye and one bad eye. And, and one eye may be a lot more um, affected than the other. It, it uh, occurs uh, in all races, all genders. Uh, nobody is immune from it. And there is no cure for keratoconus. Okay, so here we've got a picture. You can see on the right, that person's got sort of a cone. It's got a little pointy eye. Uh, that's what keratoconus looks like as it becomes severe, more severe, more moderate. Um, uh, it, it doesn't cause blindness, but you will see halos, blurry, distorted vision. So these people, um, their vision is really impacted by the disease. You can see the, the person with the hazel eyes, that's sort of round and that's normal sized. So here we go. Okay, here's the, here's the easiest thing that a lot of doctors will explain to their patients. Imagine if you cut a basketball in half, it's round and it's, and it's spherical. That's what your eye should look like. Now cut a football in half and it's kind of pointy and it's kind of misshapen. And that's what a keratoconus eye it looks like as it becomes uh, extreme. And how, why does that cause blurred vision? So if you look on the left, you'll see that's a, when a light rays enter the eye of, of someone with a normal uh, cornea, those light rays are gonna go right to the back of the eye. They're gonna 
uh, reflect off the retina, go through the optic nerve up to the brain, and voila, you've got great vision. Now, if you've got keratoconus, your eye is a little misshapen. And so when that, those light rays are coming in, suddenly they're bouncing all over the eye. And all of those visions are going to get transported up to the brain to get sorted out. And they don't always get sorted out. And that's why these people have got um, uh, halos and blurry vision and double vision. Um, and, and if you think about it, there's really an impact. These people can't drive at night because the lights are crazy. It, you know, they may not be able to see their computer, that, you know. And so you think about all the disabilities that sort of uh, go along with having um, vision that's just not crisp and clear, and you just can't um, you just can't see very well. So here we go. My first question for Dr. Wade. A lot of people say, "Well, I have astigmatism, and sometimes my eyes are you know my eyesight's a little blurry." Does that mean I have keratoconus? Okay, so great question, Mary. So astigmatism. And I'm going to take your analogy with the, the football and the basketball and kind of tweak it just a little bit. So a normal cornea with no astigmatism is going to look like a, a basketball. Every direction you go, it's the same steepness. Whereas if you were a little ant on top of that football, if you go one direction, it's steep. In one direction, it's uh, quite flat. So the football, we would say, has astigmatism. And the football shape is actually quite regular. Here we go. So Mary's got this slide up here. This this map on the left, uh, A, is regular astigmatism because when you flip it one side to the other, it's the same. Whereas uh, on image B, it's not. Uh, it looks different. It's different top to bottom. It's different left to right. And so we have here a difference between irregular astigmatism B and regular astigmatism A. And so what we're really asking about is, with your question, does someone who has normal, regular astigmatism have keratoconus? And the answer is mostly not. Uh, astigmatism that's regular is very common, can be as high as 40% in some uh, age groups. Keratoconus is also common for a disease, but it's more on the order of 1 to 400. So most of the time when you have astigmatism, it's going to be the normal run-of-the-mill astigmatism. But every once in a while, uh, you run into something that's more irregular, and that's when we get suspicious about keratoconus. Okay, those are topography maps uh, that you will be explaining a little bit later. Uh, and that is, I think, one of the, uh, the sort of the, the crucial elements in sort of making that that uh, diagnosis. And, and uh, um, those are, th that's really helpful to sort of see how uh, they don't sort of, they're not mirror images left to right or up or top to bottom uh, in that irregular astigmatism and that keratoconus. Is that a keratoconus patient, number B? Uh, that would not be your typical no. character. Okay, <laughs> but it, but it, the same the same uh, idea uh, applies. Um, that it's steep in some parts and and less steep in others. Okay, so now let's talk about who gets keratoconus. We know a little bit about how it affects your vision, but let's who, who see who gets it. Dr. Wade told us one in four hundred people have keratoconus, so it's it, it's more common than you think, but many are undiagnosed. If people, if you have a very mild case, you may never know you have keratoconus. And I'm sure he has, Dr. Wade has come across patients who are probably in their 50s, 60s, and 70s, and never knew they had it and functioned well through their whole life. Um, but there are some people who are at risk for the disease. And those are the ones that that uh, should always uh, make a point when they go for that, their exam and they talk to their eye doctor, that they mention that they have these factors that may impact what tests the doctor wants to run. The first one is collagen disorders, and collagen is a word that's going to come up later in this talk, so keep that, file that one away. And people who've got mitral valve prolapse or sleep apnea or Ehlers-Danlos, those are diseases that, because of weak uh, collagen uh, effect, on a, sort of a, have a medical impact, weak collagen in the cornea uh, is one of the reasons why keratoconus comes about. Down syndrome is a uh, is is very interesting. These these patients, these individuals, have a a thin, steep cornea, just like a keratoconus patients. There's some doctors that believe that 
the the uh, condition that Down syndrome individuals have is a little bit different uh, in that it's it's not quite keratoconus, but it's keratoconus like. And certainly, all the doctors treat it um, in the same way. They think about um, cross linking if that's appropriate. Get the patients to. Uh, do, make behavioral changes. Um, but Down syndrome, if you have a family member with Down syndrome, make sure that the doctor, um, that they they go for their annual eye exams and that the doctor is specifically looking for changes to the cornea that may may uh, be the because of keratoconus. Genetics is another thing. If you have a family member who's a first degree family member with keratoconus, you're more likely to have it. It's not a sure thing, but if you've got a parent, a sibling, or a child, you want to make sure other members of the family mention when they go to the eye doctor that that, that keratoconus runs in the family. And again, your doctor's going to have an extra look at your at your cornea and see if it's uh, if it's sort of uh, suspicious or not. There are certain ethnic groups that are more prone to uh, having keratoconus. Uh, the, in the Middle East, Saudi Arabia, Israel, um, uh, and uh, in the in India, Pakistan, India, Australia, uh, New Zealand, uh, Mexico, some in South America, it it seems to be that people who live in warmer climates, maybe with a lot of dust, uh, seem to have a higher uh, numbers of keratoconus and uh, sort of doctors are trying to figure out, is there some gene that runs in these people or is it because of the environment that they live in? Uh, there's not much keratoconus in Russia and Scandinavia. There's not much dust and, and heat up there. And then that brings us to the probably the most important thing that impacts keratoconus and that is atopy and allergies. If you've got an eye allergy You've got runny eyes, uh, your eyes itch, um, and um, it's it's something that your doctor needs to take care of um, because what people do when they have allergies is they tend to rub their eyes, and that's that's very bad in in keratoconus world. And that's going to be my second question for Dr. Wade tonight. Talk to me about why eye rubbing is so bad for keratoconus. Uh, sure thing, Mary. So if you, and you, you mentioned that in keratoconus, that the problem is that the cornea is weak. So if you have a weak cornea that's prone to bulging out, rubbing that and pressing on that and you know smashing your face into the pillow when you're sleeping at night, all those things are going to exacerbate the underlying problem. And you're going to uh, cause progression of this uh, weakness, this bulging that, that is so common in keratoconus. Um, and that's, you know, it's hard for me as a parent, I have four kids. And so when I see them going out their eyes and rubbing their eyes, I immediately think <laughs> you're going to cause this, but, uh, you know, not everyone who rubs their eyes is going to get keratoconus, but those who are at risk for it and who have that weakness are going to definitely exacerbate the problem by rubbing. Do you have any tips for, uh, that you give to your patients about how to avoid eye rubbing or do you just call them out on it? Well, you know, <laughs> the biggest, biggest uh, tip is really what you've just already done, which is to uh, to make it known, right? To to let them know that this is something they want to avoid. Typically, the patient may think, I don't remember rubbing my eyes, but if you look over at the spouse or the mom or the dad, they'll, you're, they're going to give you a straight answer. Uh, and so oftentimes we're not even aware of what we're doing uh, in terms of rubbing our eyes. Like I mentioned, sleeping or putting a lot of pressure on the eye. Uh, you can, you can, you can do this in a lot of different ways. Yeah. I, I what you say is exactly right. Is that, is that uh, so many people uh, don't even, they're not even aware that they're rubbing their eyes. Um, and it really just sort of becomes a habit, particularly in the morning when they get up. I've got a real interesting picture that I'm going to share with everybody here. This was a, uh, published last year, there was a, a, a medical school in Poland who did a, um, a, a survey of their patients and they asked people, how do you rub your eyes? And if you look at pictures one through four, 75% of people who did not have keratoconus 
picked out one of those pictures, one, two, three, or four, as you know, when I rub my eyes, that's what I do. And the greatest number was number one, where you just sort of put your finger in there and just maybe smush it around for a bit, and that's the end of it. What they found when they asked patients who had keratoconus, which of these pictures is the most likely, is most resembles how you rub your eyes, they were more than half of them picked five, six, seven, or eight. And the most common picked picture was number eight. So you could see that guy is really grinding his his uh, his his uh, knuckles into his eyes, and that's um, that's bad. But that's but that's what uh, people with keratoconus tend to do. So uh, if you if you take nothing else from this lecture tonight, uh, stop rubbing your eyes and do whatever you can to to. Uh, to uh, minimize it because uh, like Dr. Wade said, you've got weak corneas to begin with and uh, all that pressure and all that, all that uh, pushing is just going to make them, make them even worse. Great. Can you stand aside for a second? So I just want to point out, you know, I watched my wife take off her makeup and, and oftentimes she's rubbing the corner of her eye, which was really more on the eyelid. And that has maybe its own issues, but it's not as likely to cause a problem as you can see in some of these pictures on the bottom where you're really rubbing on the eye itself. So if you need to, you know, rub your eyelid a little bit, that's fine. Uh, but try to avoid putting all that pressure on the eye itself. Great. So let's now switch gears a little bit. Let's talk about how a doctor like Dr. Wade would pick up keratoconus uh, when he has a new patient or a patient who's been sent to him. So here's the question. How do you diagnose keratoconus? So I, I was just chuckling to myself because I'm thinking if you, and some of you on the call may already have been diagnosed with keratoconus and other, you know, others may just be here out of curiosity. And if you're like me, if you're here just out of curiosity, it may be at this point in the call where you're thinking, it's me. I have that. I probably <laughs> starting to worry about this. Uh, which is pretty common. Um, so to to give some background, I would say that my my dad is an amateur or was an amateur mountain climber. And in addition to the ice pick and the crampons and the other tools he had, he had a map, a topographical map, and the steepness of any particular mountain route that they were going to take. And that's that's exactly what we use to diagnose keratoconus is a topographical map. You can see here, this is a topography uh, that shows the red spots are more steep, the blue and green are more flat. So it shows us where the steep parts are on your cornea. If you think about your cornea like a small mountain, that's what this would look like. So we use this to say, is this a normal pattern or is this abnormal? Is it regular? Is it irregular? And it's quite easy to look at these topographies and say this patient has keratoconus in both eyes and it appears to be steeper. Well, is it both a right eye? But the image on the left shows a slightly different view here. So long story short, we use topography. Now there are other ways to look for keratoconus and your doctor may employ those, but eventually those will lead to getting a scan like this. Um, that's oh, Mary. What else do you want to know about that? Well, does the topography now, does that hurt? How long does it take? Is that uh, part of a normal exam usually? You can see this patient here is getting topography. It's non-contact. So they're just taking a picture. Okay. I will say it's not part of every exam. So unless your doctor is suspicious that something is going on, and they may be suspicious if they can't get you to 2020 in a new pair of glasses or contacts, or if you have some of those conditions that Mary mentioned before, then they would want to either getting this in their office or sending you to an office that has this for further evaluation. And and does it just take a few minutes or how long are you staring at, at uh, is, uh, into that machine? A few seconds. Oh, great. Okay. Sounds, sounds easy. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, it is easy. I would say most of... Keratoconus is diagnosed by optometrists, and they're very good at this. Um, not every opt optometric office has a topographer, so they they know when to refer and when to get a further evaluation. Great, great. Okay, now let's uh, switch gears again, and let's start talking about this person has come into your office, you've given that topography, and you realize that they do have keratoconus. Now let's talk about some of the treatments that um, are available 
uh, to patients. And here we go. So if you've got mild disease, like we talked about earlier, you might be able to get through your life with just glasses or contact lenses. Uh, you know, it's, 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 it's not too de debilitating. If your disease is getting worse and your doctor is following it and sees that things are changed, things are continuing to change, your eye is continuing to, to get thinner, your, your cornea is getting thinner, it's getting weaker, they're going to be referred for treatment called corneal cross-linking. And Dr. Wade's going to talk to us about that. And then if you've got really, really severe disease uh, and you can't keep contact lenses on and you can't see very well, maybe you're developing scars or other medical conditions related to the keratoconus, um, your doctor may recommend a corneal transplant. And uh, we'll also hear about that. If, if uh, Dr. Wade, if can you give me an armchair uh, diagnosis? Is that patient, that that eye that you're looking at, is that person, uh, would you say, is going to be getting a corneal transplant, or do you think you can manage that without with uh, cross-linking? What would you think if that if that eye sat down in your chair? <laughs> <laughs> That's unfair, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah, so um, it really depends on a few things. If at all possible, we like to avoid doing corneal transplants. Okay. So the technology in terms of uh, contact lenses is really great these days. So if a patient can be fit for a contact lens, we will cross-link them to stop any progression and put them in that contact lens. Okay. All right. Let's let's learn a little bit about contact lenses, and they they are really wonderful. Uh, this is a picture looking down at an eye, and you can see. Let me see. You can see that cornea is sort of off center, and it's thinner here than it is here. So this is a person with keratoconus. But you slip on this scleral contact lens, this big contact lens. This is the, the navy blue that you're looking at. And look how that sort of evens out that irregular cornea. And there's actually some water or some liquid in here. So that patient is actually having an eye bath all day long. They're seeing clearly and their eyes feel good, it's wonderful. So that's, uh, that's called a scleral lens. And that's going to, a uh, person's going to wear that and their vision is going to be improving. So let's talk about contact lenses. Uh, so again, very yep. mild cases, you might, you might get by with eyeglasses. Um, but there's lots of of contact lens varieties. And that's where you want to go to a contact lens, a doctor who knows about keratoconus and knows about all the contact lens options that are out there. And uh, if you can get a doctor who's smart about those things, it's really going to make a difference for you if you're living with keratoconus. So here's some pictures I want to share with you. You can see this is a lot bigger than this one. This is a GP, a gas permeable, or some people call them a rigid lens or a hard lens. Those are the lenses that, that most people with keratoconus were originally fit in. They get great vision, but some of them are a little uncomfortable to wear, especially as your, your cone gets a little bit steeper. Sometimes those pop out. So then the one next to it, you can see this is a lot bigger. These are about the size of a dime. These are about the size of a quarter. So these are bigger. That's called a scleral lens. That's that one we, we saw in the diagram. And those are called scleral lenses because they sit on the white part of the eye. So it's not just on the color part, the iris, but it goes all the way under the eyelids. Uh, it, it's a lot bigger, um, but uh, people who wear them say it makes all the difference in the world. They're very comfortable to wear and you get great vision. Here's something called a hybrid lens, and that has uh, a hard lens in the, at the uh, center, which gives you great vision, and the skirt that sits around it is soft, so that, that, that it's like a soft contact lens. It, it's uh, painless to wear. A lot of people like that for comfort. There's also something called a piggyback, and that's where you actually wear two, one lens on top of another. One lens for comfort close to your eye, and then one lens on top of that, that gives you great vision. Here's something real interesting. This is a prosthetic lens, and these things exist. Um, they, it, 
the doctor will take a mold of your eye. And even if your eye is very oddly shaped and it's got nicks because maybe you have scars there or maybe you've had some glaucoma surgery or something like that, they can create a, um, um, a, 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 a personalized, individualized lens that it fits you like a glove. Now, these are real expensive, but for people who have real problems with vision, that's a wonderful option that's that's been out there for a few years and um, is really uh, life-changing for people who have severe keratoconus. So there you go. Contact lenses, lots of options. Get a get a smart doctor who really understands you. They're going to ask you questions about what's your lifestyle. What are you hoping to do? Do you are you a golfer? Do you want to see far? Do you want to you know? Do you are you outside a lot? Do you do you uh, spend hours looking at a computer? All those sorts of things. Uh, and then uh, do, do you are you going to be good with cleaning them and changing them and all that sort of thing? They want to know about your life. They want to know about your habits, and they'll find the, the pair of contacts that are just right for you. So that's that's the first thing that we're gonna that you you need to do if you've got keratoconus. Second thing is called corneal collagen crosslinking, and this is what we mentioned earlier. Collagen is something in the cornea that sort of is weak for people who've got keratoconus. The the um, procedure was approved about eight years ago in the U.S. It's been done in Europe for even longer. And it is wonderful. It has a 95% success rate. So I'm going to ask Dr. Wade to jump in here and tell me what, tell me all about corneal crosslinking. Sure thing. So I just want to point out that it looks like Nathan Schramm just made a comment in the, uh, in the chat. He's one of our great optometrists in the community who fits a lot of our corneas who, uh, it's just great with these scleral lenses and advanced uh, advanced lenses. Hi, Dr. Schramm. <laughs> so, uh, in terms of what we do when we cross-link a patient. So the cross-linking procedure really is quite simple. The, the surgeon is going to remove the front cells of the eye called the epithelium. And then for about 30 minutes, the assistant will place drops of riboflavin onto the eye. Those will soak into the cornea. Then a quick check is done to make sure that the thickness of the cornea is sufficient for the for the procedure. And then there's another 30 minutes or so of looking at a UV light while more riboflavin drops are placed. And the combination of the UV light and the riboflavin makes cross links between the collagen fibrils that strengthens the cornea. Uh, at the end of the procedure, a contact lens is placed. You are gonna be started on some antibiotic drops, steroid drops, and we take the contact lens off in a, you know five to seven days, and you start the you start the healing process. So the, the procedure itself is quite simple from a surgical standpoint. Okay, I have a slide here, and I think it refers to a anecdote you're going to tell us about doc from Dr. Parker. Oh yeah. <laughs> so Dr. Jack Parker is a fellow cornea specialist, and he has this great analogy, and I I love it because it really helps. Um, set the stage for how to think about keratoconus and how to think about cross-linking. So imagine that uh, your house is like your cornea and imagine that the fire department is like cross-linking. So you can imagine that you will be in a much better spot if you call the fire department when you slightly catch the, you know, the slightest whiff of smoke from one corner of your house and you can't even see it yet versus waiting until, you know, the news channel is outside and your house is up in flames and half the neighborhood <laughs> are looking at your house and and uh, roasting marshmallows next to it. Um, the point being that the earlier you can stop the progression of keratoconus, the more you're left with in terms of useful corneal shape and 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 better vision without needing as much technology to help you. So really if if there's one thing that i want people to leave thinking about it's that if you have keratoconus or know someone who has keratoconus they need to get tested and if there's any hint of progression or even before progression potentially you want to lock into place that cornea where it's at so you don't lose any uh ground so one thing that it, uh i i i'd like you to go back and sort of uh 
reaffirm is that some people think cross-linking is going to cure their keratoconus. It's they're going to they're going to take this treatment and then they're going to have great vision going forward. Is that the case? So keratoconus. The best way of thinking about this is keratoconus cures the progression. Right. Oh, sorry. Cross-linking. Cross-linking progression of keratoconus it doesn't cure keratoconus itself but it cures the progression and we can deal with keratoconus as long as it's not progressing and getting worse right right i think that's uh that's sort of a uh, patients get confused and think well if i have this treatment then my vision's going to return and everything's going to be great and really the what what dr wade is saying and what your doctors will tell you if you have keratoconus is you just want it stop it getting worse so that the vision you have today is the worst vision you'll ever have. And, and a lot of patients who, once they understand that, there is some sort of relief because even if your vision is not great, if you know that it's never going to get worse, that this is as bad as it's going to be, it's a lot easier to cope. Uh, I think a lot of patients, uh, once they understand that that they, the point is just to stop it from getting worse, not to make it go away altogether. So here's the... Um, machine uh how long does the treatment take well the whole procedure like i outlined is about an hour you okay. actually you light for 30 minutes but you need to load the cornea with the riboflavin for 30 minutes prior to that so it's not a long procedure um it, it's fairly fairly quick and the you just asked how long it was yeah that's it can you tell us about any pain or what what does the patient experience sure. so during the procedure people are quite comfortable we use numbing drops to keep the eye and the patient happy but there is some pain in in, in the days following the procedure and that's because the current fda approved version of crosslink requires us to remove some of those front cells there is work uh, being done to see if we can do that without removing the front cells but currently like i said that's the fda approved approach and that's what we do here at uci and, and when you say remove those uh, cells, are you you to um, you take a sponge or a, a fork or a you know what are, you're scraping them a little bit? Is is it feel like a paper cut or you know? We we have our little ways of surgically removing those. Okay, it helps us remove those cells, but they grow back very quickly. And okay. again, contact lens we place helps provide some relief. You know, it covers those those nerve endings while the patient's healing. But I'm very upfront with patients. You're going to have a few days of maybe saying some bad words about me. And then after <laughs> three or four days, you're going to maybe be a little grumpy about things. But after that, after a week, we're going to be friends again. Yeah. I, I uh, National Keratoconus Foundation did a survey a couple of years ago uh, of asking about the um, amount of pain that people experienced after cross-linking. And surprisingly, it was all over the place. Uh, some patients who had the procedure, the FDA approved one, um, said that you know that they, they, they felt bad for an hour or two, but by the next day they they went to work, everything was okay. You know, other people who had a procedure where they didn't remove the cells complained of great pain, and and so it really is sort of what you know, they, up to the individual. I think that it's not. Um, it's not a sure thing that you'll have horrible pain and the pain may be very short, um, you know, and, and uh, so certainly I would say that the treatment is worth it. I, I, I think you probably agree uh, for the right people. It's, it's, uh, it's the best thing we can offer. I have another picture that maybe you can explain a little bit. And this is that cross-linking. Um, this is sort of a diagram that's, that, that's used a lot. Could you, sort of talk us through what this means? Sure. Before I do that, let me just jump into a point you just made. So is it worth it? Anyone, any surgeon who has seen the effects that can happen from a, a corneal transplant, 100% tell you that getting corneal cross-linking is much, much better than that. In fact, if my child had keratoconus, I would want them cross-linked as soon as I possibly can to preserve as much of their corneal structure. I think it's a great procedure. Uh, no procedure, you know, there's, there's not a procedure out there that doesn't have some issues with it, but this is, if there's one that's at the top of the list of great procedures to uh, to use for disease, this is it. It's really fantastic. So to get to your question, cross-linking 
So the white lines here are the collagen fibrils, and the green lines are these cross links or bonds between the fibrils. The procedure does what you see on the right. It creates more of these cross links between them. And so there's a stronger structure that's there afterwards. So it stiffens the, the it's going to stiffen the cornea as it heals, and it's going to be uh, unlikely to to uh, to continue to um, uh, form that cone. Do we know why some people have fewer bonds than others? Is that is that understood, or that's sort of the mystery of keratoconus? That's yeah, that's beyond my pay grade. I'm sure. Okay. There's <laughs> so a surgeon who takes care of these patients, I don't understand that as as fully. Okay, that's a that's a. It's a question for the ages. All right. Uh, okay, so now we're into the serious stuff. So corneal transplant is reserved for the really uh, most severe disease. And uh, uh, Dr. Wade is an expert in uh, PK or PKP or penetrating keratoplasty. That is the uh, corneal transplant procedure. Uh, that's the one that comes from a, a donated uh cornea from a deceased person. And um, I would love to hear you explain to patients what you do and what your thinking is when you're doing a corneal transplant for keratoconus. Well, before we had cross-linking, this was the only treatment we had, right? Contacts and, and corneal transplants. <clears throat> the interesting, <clears throat> excuse me, the interesting thing to remember about getting a corneal tr transplant is it's not going to remove your need to wear a specialty contact lens. So you're going to need one of these scleral lenses, whether we do a transplant or not. What it does help with, though, is it helps remove any scarring. So if there's scarring that's present, that's blocking your vision, we can remove your cornea and replace it with uh, the cornea from someone who's passed away. As you can see in the picture, there are a lot of sutures. There's a lot that's... Uh, that, that's that goes along with this procedure in terms of healing. The healing time is very long. Um, vision will go up and down like a roller coaster when you've had one of these things. And you're at higher risk for things like glaucoma, cataract progression, uh, iris issues, all sorts of things. So if we can, if we can at all avoid them, we like to avoid them. Um, but when scarring's present or our hand is forced, we, we move ahead. Now, so I, I personally, uh, am not specializing these anymore. Uh, we have many call, uh, many of my colleagues still do this. Um, but I'm still doing cross-linking because I believe in it so so heavily. So um, the the picture on the uh, uh, the drawing on the right talks about um, the different layers to a cornea. Now, cornea is as thin as a credit card. I mean, it's so thin. I can't believe that you guys are able to sort of uh, distinguish between all these different layers, but uh, apparently you do. <laughs> Uh, can you tell me, uh, do you replace all of those or uh, where would a scar form? Uh, does it form in any of those layers or, or, uh, it, um, it, a scar can form in any of those layers, but in okay. particular, you're going to have scars that are in the posterior stroma around decimase membrane, which can fracture, uh, with progression of the keratoconus. So, um, I, I don't think you have to really worry about these layers so much. There are some corneal transplants, which try to preserve the patient's own endothelium or the innermost layer there. Um, but that's really a surgeon preference, whether they're going to do the full thickness or the, or the surgery that spares those. Uh, okay. Uh, and that, that purple one is the epithelium. That's the part you're going to scratch when you do the cross-linking, the very top outermost part, right? And the reason we do that is not because we want to cause you pain, but because <laughs> when those cells are present, the riboflavin can't really soak into the as well. So we're, we're trying to get that riboflavin so it can cause the most uh, benefit for you possible. Now with, um, when you've done a corneal transplant and you've, you found a donor cornea, uh, you're going to, uh, remove a, the diseased keratoconus cornea, and you're going to put this one on top, uh, or you're going to replace it and put this one on. Is it, it the, the stitches look uh, amazing that, that a doctor would have to do those. Now, do those stitches come out or do they stay in? What what happens uh, with those stitches? So those stitches eventually will come out. They can be left in and, and can stay in for a long period of time. But I want to I wanna 
respond to something you said. So we're, we are removing part of the cornea. You'll notice though, we're not removing the entire cornea because there are a lot of risks with doing that. You get too close to the blood vessels and the immune rejection and glaucoma and all sorts of things. So even though we're fixing part of the cornea, the peripheral cornea still has the keratoconus problem. So it's not a complete fix of the entire cornea. So what you're saying is if I have keratoconus, severe keratoconus and maybe scarring, and I undergo a corneal transplant, again, I'm not cured of my keratoconus. Is that what you're saying? You're not cured of, you're not cured of your keratoconus, but we're changing the shape to something more manageable mm -hmm. and moving the scar so that when Dr. Schramm or one of these other doctors that, that works with contact lenses fits you for a contact lens, the light can get through the cornea, the contact lens can fit, and you can see well again. If uh, if I had a corneal transplant, can you tell me, uh, would I be on medications for a while? What What's going to happen after the after you, you send me home? Good question. So uh, this cornea, like I said, comes from someone else. And your body recognizes that this is not your tissue. So you need to be on something that's going to dial down your body's response. Your body wants to reject this tissue. So initially, we'll have you on some steroid drops. It will keep your body's immune system, uh, you know, a little toned down so it's not going to reject the cornea. And how long does that go on for? Yeah, great question. It typically for a couple of years. At first, it's, wow. but as, as time goes on, we, we can eventually wean most people off of those steroid drops. Hmm. One thing that I've read is that um, people with keratoconus uh, do very well with cornea transplants. Is that your experience? Is that they they tend to um, not have rejection or graft failure as much as other diseases? Correct. So other diseases that require corneal transplants may be someone gets a, an infection and has an ulcer and they have scarring and blood vessels growing to the cornea. So anytime there's a lot of inflammation, you're going to have a tougher time at keeping that cornea. And keratoconus has a lot less inflammation, if any. And so it, those corneas will last a lot longer. Um, I have uh, had patients contact us who've had a transplant that lasted 30, 40 years. Is that, I mean, it's that seems amazing, but uh, I guess it happens. It can last, they can start rejecting or fail right off, or they can last a long, long time. Yeah, yeah. that's great news. So we, we've gone through sort of what's available for someone with keratoconus. Uh, you know, hopefully uh, contact lenses and cross-linking will take care of it. But you can see if you have a transplant, uh, there's excellent uh, outcomes. And uh, although it's a, it's a serious, significant surgery, um, they, they know what they're doing with it. And we're going to finish up with something that um, I, I, I get a lot of questions about. Um, and that is cataracts and keratoconus. So we all know that um, most seniors have cataracts uh, and most seniors end up having cataract surgery. Um, but people with keratoconus, whether or not they've had a transplant, whether they just, they, they're very uh, worried about their eyes. They're very worried about having surgery to their eye. They've been told their whole life, you have a weak cornea, you have a thin cornea, and they're very scared of, about going um, and getting this, uh, their cataracts removed. So can you um, talk to me about, um, can you have cataract surgery at keratoconus and what should you expect? And what do you tell your patients who've got keratoconus? Well, first, I just want to say to any patient who's in that position that it's normal to be concerned about your eyes. Whether you have keratoconus or not, people have anxiety when it comes to having surgery in general and in particular surgery on their eyes. So I, I get that. We get that. And, uh, and and we'll be patient with you as you're, as you're kind of considering your options. But absolutely, patients with keratoconus get cataracts. They're going to need those cataracts removed. We just have to take that into account because when we put a... When we, when we do cataract surgery, we take out the old lens, the lens you were born with, it's become cloudy, and we put a new lens in its place. And in order to pick the power of that new lens, we have to take into account the curvature of the cornea and the length of the eye, among other factors. And as we've been discussing, keratoconus is a disease that really affects the curvature of the cornea. So we, your, and we or your surgeon will have to take the curvature into account. We'll have to take into account whether or not you plan on staying in contact lenses after surgery. 
Um, uh, a whole host of things uh, we'll we'll need to discuss before uh, before your surgery. But yes, people can and do uh, very well with uh, cataract surgery after having uh, keratoconus. And in fact, I will say because when people come in for cataract surgery, we routinely get one of those topographies. This is the time that I find a lot of people who never knew they had keratoconus. We say, oh, look, this topography, <laughs> you're 65 or 70, but look, you have you have keratoconus. And usually by that time, and we haven't talked about this yet during this talk, there's a natural cross-linking that occurs just throughout life, just being outside in the UV light and just with your normal diet. So usually it's not progressive at that time, um, but it's, it's a point of discussion and people are often surprised that that's that shows up on their topography. That's interesting because um, I hear from a lot of patients that they found out that they uh, have uh, keratoconus when they went, they wanted to have Lasix and they wanted to have, they wanted to have the vision correction surgery. And now I'm hearing from people who are 60, 70 years old who are saying, I have, I just learned I have keratoconus, but I guess that's it. They were probably getting lined up for their for their cataract surgery and and uh and as as a an added bonus they they've they've been told they they have a chronic uh, eye disease for their for their whole life that they didn't they were unaware of that's that's real interesting now you wouldn't do anything for for um a 70 year old who is learning for the first time they have keratoconus other than maybe take into account that odd shape to their eye when they're when you're selecting a artificial lens Correct. I mean, in, in rare cases, and there are rare cases of progression even later in life. So you, you don't want to take cross-linking off the table based on age. But uh, assuming they're not progressing, uh, yeah, you have to have a frank discussion about lens options. There's some lenses that are just not going to be a great fit and other lenses that are going to be uh, potentially great depending mm -hmm. on schools and whether or not they want to wear uh, contacts afterwards. Yeah. Th so, so there would be a way or there, I, I guess you wouldn't promise this, but, but you might hope for it is that you could actually improve the vision of, of somebody based on what a lens you select. Uh, so somebody who, somebody actually could have better vision at age 60 than they had at age 30. If they've, if, if everything goes right. <laughs> well, anytime we approach cataracts, we're not just trying to take out the cataract itself, the cloudiness. We're also trying to improve the entire refractive system of the eye. So yeah, with any patient, including keratoconic patients, we're trying to make their vision the best we possibly can. And, and for many patients, that is better than what they've had in the past. That's wonderful. Um, it, it, as, an, as an aside, if I have had a corneal transplant, can I still have cataract surgery? You can. So, uh, you know, when you get a cataract and it progresses, it's going to cause a lot of um, blurriness eventually curable blindness, but blindness. And so we have to go ahead at some point to take it out. There are some things to think about when you have cataract surgery in the setting of a corneal transplant, including those endothelial cells, how, you know, that graft may have lasted 30 years, but it may not put up with additional surgery like mm -hmm. cataract. So mm -hmm. we will do an evaluation of the health of the transplant, the health of those cells on the backside of the cornea, as well as the shape and, and other factors. But yeah, definitely possible. Great. Well, it's so much information tonight. So we have uh, a couple questions I'm going to throw at you. Uh, this is an interesting one. Can you repeat cross-linking? Yeah, there are rare patients who may still progress after pro cross-linking, and, and we can uh, repeat them. There, early on when we were starting cross-linking, there were some places that were doing it in a different way and not getting the same results. Not They weren't using the FDA approach the FDA approved approach. And so I have done a repeat cross linking on those patients with good results. Um, but even with the FDA approach, you can have a rare patient who may need uh, either additional cross linking or, or procedures. Yeah. I think the statistics are like 95%. So there is that 5% of the population who may not get the result that you're, you're looking for, but not, it, there's sort of no bad outcome. It's just, you just go through the same procedure with the drops and the light again. Right. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, he, here's a question that came up about dry eye and keratoconus. I know there seems to be a lot of dry eye in the, this keratoconus population. Do you have any sort of uh, sense of why that is or what, what that means? 
I don't know if I necessarily have a lot to add to that other than that dry eye is just ubiquitous. I mean, if you okay. were to sit here in my office, only almost every single patient that I see has some amount of dry eye. And I find myself talking to, to almost everyone about that. I will note that the dry eye and, you know, blepharitis and things that go along with dry eye can cause people to have itchy eyes and want to rub their eyes. So for sure, treating the dryness in patients with keratoconus is going to be a key factor in, in decreasing their likelihood of rubbing their eyes, like you mentioned earlier. Can you talk to me about um, what does dry eye feel like to a patient? So if I'm a, you know, because I, I understand that sometimes watery eyes are it's called dry eye so what what would somebody who has dry eye experience yeah you're right there are a lot of different uh, symptoms that people can have and when people do have watery eyes with dry eyes they they almost are a little frustrated with you when you tell them they have dry eyes <laughs> why doc <laughs> did you do what i'm saying <laughs> my eyes are running but dryness symptoms include irritation uh, tearing blurry vision, pain, headaches, I mean, all sorts of things. And some patients will have one and not the other. So you may have patients who don't, they don't feel like they have any issues with their eyes, but they're just intermittently blurry. And that's dryness. Just like with another patient whose eyes are really painful and irritating, but their vision's fine. They also have dry eye. And blepharitis is another thing you mentioned. Tell me what that is. The blepharitis has to do with inflammation and buildup along the eyelid margins. So the eyelids are the protectors of the eyes and any inflammation there is going to affect this ocular surface. And so my bombing gland dysfunction, blepharitis, all these really, these all swim together in, in, in creating dry eye disease. So if I'm looking at my eyelids and they're sort of pink and maybe puffy, that might be a um, blepharitis. Yeah, that's a great, that, I mean, it might be, it might not. These are the things you want to talk to your optometrist or ophthalmologist about. Okay. And and what you're saying is that you have treatments that could uh, e either make the blepharitis go away or make it more comfortable. And so I'm less likely to be rubbing my eyes and, and feeling that sort of um, irritation. We do. We do have treatments for both. Sometimes patients respond really quickly. Other times uh, it takes quite a bit. And like keratoconus, dry eye is a chronic disease. So it's something that uh, worsens over time. I don't like to use the word age with patients. So it worsens with their birthdays and uh, and it can flare after surgeries or other, you know, other things. What um, When does dry eye sort of come into the picture? Is that sort of at, at middle age or would somebody have dry eye as a, as a teenager? You know, we're seeing it. I'm seeing it younger and younger. A lot of it has to do with screen time and mm. us are on screens all day long. So uh, air conditioning, humidity levels, uh, medication use, uh, hormone status, you know, postmenopausal women have more difficulty. There's just a, a whole list of things that can contribute to dry eye. It, it's wow. really, I think it may be a whole talk in this community lecture series. Wow. Wow. Um, here's another question that's come up is um, it's about the corneal transplants that we do at Gavin Herbert. Do you know how many we do a year? You know, you asked me that earlier, and I don't have an exact number, but I would say it's probably uh, on the order of around 200 a year. Okay. And now, we're very fortunate at Gavin Herbert in that there's an eye bank located right on site. Isn't that right? Yeah. You know, if anyone has care to come, it's an interesting learning more about eye banking. It's really fascinating. I really appreciate the work that eye banks do. You know, they're dealing with patients and their families at a really difficult times you know someone on one end has passed away and someone on the other end is is relying on on that uh, person to be a, a organ donor so that they can have a chance to see again so it's really it's really a special process to be a part of and i and i also talk to any of my patients who've had corneal transplants to you know reach out to the eye bank learn more about it consider writing a letter to the family who who lost some so that they can understand what this means to you mm. It's true. Yeah. You know, uh, National Keratoconus has a um, a uh, podcast and we interviewed uh, a, a young gentleman of 80 uh, uh, last week. And he talked about getting his first transplant for keratoconus in 1979 or 1980. And he talked about being in the hospital for three days and sort of this dramatic, you know, he was an inpatient and he says, I was sharing the room with, with a person who got the other 
cornea and you know we were talking about that we both you know we were but it's just it seems so so uh so different than what a cornea transplant now is uh, i'm assuming nobody's spending the night they're going home uh with uh after after the the surgery huh yeah different experience but that's an interesting story you bring up yeah yeah. So uh, this was great. I think we all learned a lot about uh, uh, keratoconus tonight. Uh, and so I want to wrap up. Uh, well, thank you. Thank- one quick question, oh, if you have sure. time. Sure. Um, <clears throat> this is from someone in the chat. My 27 year old daughter was diagnosed with KC several years ago. She has worn glasses since she was a child and contacts for 15 years or so without an issue. It sounds like she's a good candidate, possibly for the cross linking procedure. What is the best way to find an ophthalmologist who has a lot of experience in this procedure and does most medical insurance cover this or is this considered elective? So I'll take that. That's a great question. So first off, I would say your child may or may not need cross-linking if they're not progressing. That's the first thing. Um, But it's definitely worth checking. Sometimes patients will get a good fit with the contact lens and they may be progressing underneath that contact lens without uh, without, uh, us knowing. So definitely want to check to see if they're progressing. In order to find a good ophthalmologist, um, I think, Mary, I'm going to let you take that. But in- I, I say come to GHEI and see Dr. Wade. <laughs> that would be great, except that she is no longer um, on my eye insurance and she moved to New York City. Oh, there's, there's there's a few doctors in New York who know what they're doing. So uh, we actually, uh, the uh, National Keratoconus has a, um, a referral uh, map so you can go onto our website and click New York and see who's there. So does uh, does progressing like if if her prescription is always worsening year after year? I mean, the girl if she wears glasses, they are so thick. Does that necessarily indicate the keratoconus is progressing, or it just has to do with vision changes in general? Uh, it's highly likely that's one of the criteria for is keratoconus progressing is if the if the prescription is changing uh, so, okay be very suspicious of that okay thank you yeah and you're you know the thank last you. question here was does medical insurance cover this so you mentioned your eye insurance this is covered under medical insurance and if if the if you meet the criteria i've found that most medical insurances will cover this procedure okay thank you no problem. okay so i just want to wrap up by um one of the observations we have, and there's been published articles about it, is that the the people with keratoconus have a hard time uh, explaining their condition to others and find that people are not empathetic. What they find is people say, why don't you just get a new pair of glasses? And and as we've learned, that's really not going to solve the problem uh, permanently or, or even for a, a long period of time. So uh, people with keratoconus have feelings of isolation and depression uh, because at most of them are fairly young when they get their, di- their diagnosis. They're, you know, they're in high school or college and they're told, well, you have this eye disease and it's just going to get worse. And so it's it's uh, and it, there's no cure. So it, it, it is a little frightening and it and it does sort of uh, cause people to be concerned. So w- we encourage people to take advantage of some of the things that we have at the National Keratoconus Foundation. And I want to talk to them about talk to you about we we've, we've got information. Uh, one of the wonderful things we do is something called World Keratoconus Day. It's celebrated each November. We started that here at Gavin Herbert. It's now celebrated all around the world. We also have two ambassadors that I'm very proud of, and I want to introduce you to the two of them. One of them is Joey Gase. He is a NASCAR driver. Uh, so just think about somebody who's driving 200 miles an hour and he sees double or <laughs> blurs or halos. So it's kind of scary, but he has one of those um, uh, custom made contacts and he sees great and he's very happy to share his story with people. He uh, also, his mother uh, was a, a died a, and uh, they, they um, donate a lot of the tissue. So he he's sort of interested in uh, corneal transplants and and how that has helped so many lives. The other person who we dearly love here at NKCF is Tommy Pham. He's a member of the Arizona Diamondbacks. He had a great World Series, although the team came up short. Tommy has been wonderful about telling people about his life with keratoconus and talking about some of the challenges he faces. So we're always very grateful when he shares his story because uh, more people 
see that and they realize that you can um, that, that that even though you've got bad vision, it shouldn't keep you down. So here's what National Keratoconus uh, Foundation does. We have brochures that we can mail to you for free. We do a podcast with some really interesting uh, guests, uh, doctors, and patients who share stories and and sort of share insights about uh, about life with keratoconus. We have a, uh, an e-newsletter that goes out to 20,000 people worldwide with uh, updates on um, research and treatments. Uh, we have these uh, webinars, much like the community lecture we're listening to tonight. We're going to have one next week where the topic is going to be keratoconus and cataracts. So if you haven't had enough, if Dr. Wade hasn't answered all your questions, uh, we'll have another one there. And then we also have a video library where you can watch uh, old pre previous webinars and and um, follow follow along that. So that is, I think, just about it. These are our contact information. Again, the National Keratoconus, we, we are a, an, an international organization, but we're located right here at um, UCI, and we're so proud to be a part of UCI. And I'm so proud to have colleagues like Dr. Wade who answer all my questions <laughs> and um, refer his patients to us so we can help them. Um, get get going in terms of a new diagnosis and maybe give them some some written material they can share uh, with family members and with friends so that everybody understands a little bit more about some of the challenges they face. So I am thrilled to uh, to be here tonight and to answer your questions and to tell you a little bit more about this really interesting disease. So. I think you deserve a lot of credit for providing a lot of information and comfort to patients and their families and, and your podcast and other resources. I mean, the doctors you talk to are top notch and, and really provide a lot of uh, color to this, to this experience that patients have when they, and the doctors have uh, when dealing with keratoconus. So thank you for all your work.